everyone. We are now live on the Three Martini Lunch, a virtual uh, networking event uh, that's taking place all over the country uh, through uh, Facebook uh, on the Rockstar Connect network. Rockstar Connect is powering this. I'm uh, excited to see we have a few new panelists uh, with us today. So for their benefit and for the benefit of those uh, uh, listening out in social media land, uh, I want to explain the structure of uh, Three Martini Lunch. Uh, Three Martini Lunch is an uh, you know, entirely virtual event. The only people that are in the same rooms are Sarah Elliott and myself. Sarah is the producer of the show and also uh, the co-creator and founder of Rockstar Connect. Uh, Rockstar Connect is a national uh, business networking event. It's uh, when it's not COVID, we're doing it in hundreds of cities uh, around the country. Right now, we are on our little box on the TV, but we're enjoying ourselves. This is probably, you know, well over, we've done well over 30 of these three martini lunches, and the structure we use is success is contagious. What is success is contagious? Instead of just coming on and saying what you do, we want to know who you are. And uh, specifically in the first hour of the event, we'd like everyone to go around and share their success of the week. Uh, that success could be business oriented. It could be success you had for a client. It could be uh, you know family success, whatever it may be. It could even be a birthday uh, uh, or that you just showed up here at the event today. Uh, the second hour of the event, we will have uh, the question of the week, and the question of the week is to further determine uh, a little bit about how, you know, your philosophy of business, your philosophy of life, so people can learn how to uh, learn about you, but also get to know you and trust you. I really appreciate everyone coming on today, and that, it looks like we have two new people today, uh, Arlene and uh, Jean. Uh, I've met Jean before. I've heard good things about you, Arlene, uh, from Sarah, so I can't wait to jump in on this. Now, uh, we do want to point out, as you can see in the chat, uh, one of our panelists, it's her birthday today. Uh, should we sing her happy birthday, or is that a little much? Oh, let's sing. Okay, let's sing. Uh, it's Jenny, raise your hand. Raise your hand, Jenny. <laughs> Okay, uh, let's all go. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to, you. to you. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to, to you. you. Happy, Happy birthday, Jenny Midgley. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. To you. To you. Now, now that Thank you all so much. How much we really love you because since we now broadcasted the happy birthday <laughs> of this, we will get a notification from uh, uh, ASCAP charging us $10,000 for copyright use. There you go. It was so, less than 10 seconds, that's fine. Yeah. So we didn't chintz out in any way. Two seconds, two seconds just enough to, to click it. But it was well, it was well worth the $10,000. At least uh, it wasn't sung well. So it wasn't <laughs> sung, I think it was uh, sung with a, a great bravado and, uh, and beauty. It was a beautiful song for a beautiful person. Thank you, I appreciate all of you. <laughs> uh, because it's your birthday, we won't make you wait till like the very end to share your success. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what has been your success for the week? Um, sure. Thank you so much. Um, and seriously, like I'm, I'm 150% sincere. That was lovely. Thank you. Um, so yes, I am Jenny Mitchley. I'm a digital content specialist. Uh, I help people get seen and stay seen on their digital platforms uh, by creating content that sells without being salesy. And uh, I have an online course called Stories and Strategy. It's right there, up in my screen. Um, <laughs> and I'm also a brand and marketing photographer. Um, successes this week, um, the most recent um, launch, uh, cohort, I guess, of Stories and Strategy is live. First class is Thursday. Um, so I have some really cool participants that are going to be joining us for that. And um, I have some really fun new clients that I'm going to be working with. And, you know, I mean, it's my birthday. I got duck donuts thing. today <laughs> and my that's pumpkin great. spice latte. What's bad about that? Well, you've been very good at keeping, you know, all that's going on pretty normal and, but keeping safe and enjoying yourself. I actually saw a post 
from someone today, and this is not like someone's mother or grandmother or something along those lines. It said that they are going to a restaurant for the first time since March. Since March. Mm -hmm. So what, what do you think got it better now that he could go out now than all these months that he's locked himself up in, in, inside eating cans of tuna fish? You know, I mean, I don't even know if it's something about safety as more as it's just about, you know, kind of adjustment to life, right? Like my parents, I think, have been out three times and one of those times was to go to Wegmans and my mom said it wasn't worth it and she wouldn't do it again, you know? And it's like, you know, they haven't been to a restaurant. Can you try to open that light back on, please? <laughs> My family is screwing me over right now. <laughs> going in blackface or something. <laughs> so yeah, I mean everybody's just adjusting in their own way and their own different. There it is. Um, welcome, back. welcome back, yeah, uh, in their own different way. So I think it's just you know everybody gets the grace to do what they need to do during this time, right? That's right. I mean, my parents have only been out once since March. We took my mother out for a birthday, but I think my father's using this especially to to uh, hold up his uh, his cheapness motto of not liking to pay restaurants. Now he has an actual reason for not taking my mother out. Uh, he does, They do go to grocery stores frequently. Uh, Sarah and I, we do go out. Uh, we have been to restaurants. It's a little creepy because they're sort of empty, which is weird because we love the people watching aspect of it. Uh, but we are going tomorrow to the most open city probably in the United States. It never closed down. I don't think there's anything that could ever close it down. Myrtle Beach, the, the most open city and the most open state. It's pretty open down there, isn't it, Katie? It's been very open, but it's also been highly contagious COVID there. So um, that's, so yeah, it's, I would be, just be careful when you go. Well, we're, we're wearing uh, full hazmat suits. Yeah. Uh, and on top of that, Halloween mask. Good to get our Halloween trick-or-treating uh, in place. We are bringing the two dogs uh, down with us in our, in, our, in our convertible. So that's gonna be interesting how we fit them in with all of our stuff. And so uh, Katie, you're down in uh, South Carolina. You could tell us a little bit about yourself and what has been your success in the last week? So I'm Katie Blumquist. I'm the founder and executive director of the nonprofit Going Places. We provide new custom bikes to every child at once in the low-income elementary schools in big surprise bike reveals. And I also teach people how to start nonprofits through an online course. And I take them through with one-on-one -on -one coaching in real time, month by month, for the first seven months of starting their nonprofit. And this week, my biggest success has been the past week. Um, probably I'm just getting ready to, a week from today, I'll be doing a webinar, another webinar on fundraising. So it's just been getting the word out about that and getting people, seeing people sign up and all that. Well, feel free to drop that into the chat. I haven't I seen that much of you on Facebook. I'm guessing Facebook is hiding you from my feed. Maybe. They're, they're <laughs> saying sure. he's liked too much of her stuff, <laughs> or he must not want to see anything. It's like the opposite <laughs> sort of thing, because you, you, you've been pretty slim on my Facebook feed, and I believe Sarah's as well. Um, no, I mean, I've been posting um, stuff quite often, so I'm not, I'm not, I think you have to, like, interact with my posts, like, not like them. You have to comment. Liking doesn't do anything with the algorithm. You have to actually comment. Okay, I will be commenting. That's how, that, that's how like, I think the algorithm gets, gets things to start showing up in your feed. Well, I don't know why they took you out of the feed, but we'll have to figure <laughs> that out. Maybe uh, our, our new guest and uh, panelist, uh, Gene Volpe, who is, is an expert on all things video, mm -hmm. social media, and marketing, he can share with us uh, a little bit about the reason of that, if he feels like it. If not, he can just tell us a little bit about himself and what has been your success in the last week, Gene. So, yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I got to tell you, though, Stephen, I feel a little duped. You feel I, a little duped? Yeah, a little bit. I, I was told that there were going to be martinis sent to my house for this thing, and I'm over here drinking water. <laughs> okay, who screwed that up? Who, Greg who McDaniel. Didn't, who didn't send the martinis over to the house? <laughs> hey, so not everybody is drinking alcohol uh, on, at this time of day. I am drinking a coffee filled with uh, Kahlua and Amaretto for you and i believe that dominic may be having something alcoholic 
but otherwise it's probably just Sarah, Dominic, and myself. I will be better prepared next time, I promise yeah, you. Yeah, but I usually usually have a drink, and that's probably my drink of the week, although we are going to Myrtle Beach. I've never been there before, but I understand it's it's pretty wild there, right? Is that right, Katie? They drink down there. <laughs> they don't have water, and they deliver martinis to your room. Okay, Gene. Uh, so I'm sorry we duped you. Uh, so you <laughs> just have water right now. I apologize for that. No worries. So apparently there's a drinking game uh, going on uh, in the chat. Uh, Gene, so what's been your success for the week? Cool. So I'm Gene Volpe. I'm a digital architect with a company called GVI Media. And uh, I do, I, I heard a lot of what I do and what Jenny was talking about. It sounds, my elevator pitch sounded a lot like hers. Um, so my win of the week, I guess, I signed on with a, with a nice company. Uh, we got, we got a, new, a new client that's going to end up changing the scope of the way we're doing business. And I'm kind of excited. I, I was hoping I could do something a little more personal, but that's probably going to, that'll seep into my personal life the way that's going to play out, which is a good thing, not a negative thing. So I'm real excited about this new partnership that we've developed. And um, that's really been my big week of the month, really, if I have to be honest. Well, that's a good, that's a good week getting a new client. Uh, I read uh, a post today about someone here locally who usually has some very positive posts about his business. And unfortunately he's talking about closing his doors. Uh, so I'm hoping to get on a phone call with him because I have some ideas of, of some needs that you know, his company could, could be fulfilling for people right now. He's in technology and we all have technology needs right now. Yeah. There's, you know, our room where we do our, uh, zoom cast from is getting worse and worse uh the lighting and everything else uh, i guess just as the year progresses it's not as great a space and we can't use natural lighting in these two tin can uh candle lights or whatever they are that we have that are pretending to be professional lights so we do have someone coming out in the next week or so to redo our our zoom and webinar room has anybody actually created a business from this yet like where you go to someone's house and, and create like the incredible in-house uh, studio has anyone heard of that jeff are you doing that yet it's not the primary focus of our business but we're in the process right now of setting up a studio for a client so that we can do recurring shots in a similar looking place every single week yeah Right. Okay. Well, that's great. Is that, do you think there's a demand for that? Uh, I've heard of other companies consulting on zoom studios for companies that just want to zoom themselves, but uh, whether or not that's a huge need, I don't know. Good question. Yeah. So Joe Navarro is in the audience. Joe, I thought you were going to be on the panel today. What's going on? Well, let, let Sarah know. Maybe she can send you a link so we can get you on, on the actual panel because we wanted to hear from you. It's been, it's been a while. Uh, Jeff, what is, besides getting uh, this new client and doing their studio, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and what successes you've uh, had in the last week. Sure, so I'm Jeff Messer, co-founder of Enreach, and we do uh, videos production as a service. So think about software as a service where you don't have to buy it once, you own it all year long, or for as long as you pay your subscription, we're the same way with, doing video production for live streaming, for promotion, and for advertising. Um, I'm going to take mine on the personal side, but it actually melds well with our, pers our professional life. We're a big lacrosse family, Stephen. Um, all my children have played lacrosse growing up. And this past week, we had the opportunity to actually shoot a bunch of promo footage for uh, a local club who happened to be hosting two of the top players in the uh, professional lacrosse league, or PLL, and being able to turn now turn that into a bunch of great social media content for the club. So we always love it when our personal passions and our professional passions can collide, or not collide, but I guess gel well together. That's terrific. And, uh, you know, doing things that you like is also great for your business. It's a great, you know, a lot of real estate agents will come to me. They say, oh, I don't know how to build business. I say, well, what do you like to do? So I like to play golf. I like participating in PTA, being a good mother. I said, we'll do all those things times 10 and, and you're going to get plenty of business. I mean, now the wheels are turning. I feel like there is no one out there that's doing these studios as an, on a regular basis. So if anyone wants to start that company uh, with me, we can definitely produce the, the leads for you. That's just what we need to start more companies this week. 
Hey, uh, Sarah's shaking her head. We cannot start any more companies this week. That's a big no. But, you know, I'm still game. Just don't shoot me. Joe Navarro, thank you. I thought, you know, when you re reached out to me last week, I thought you were actually going to be on. So I was sort of surprised to see in the audience. Can <laughs> your mic working? Yep, I'm right here. Okay, Joe, you have, I know you have a few things coming up that we'd like to hear about. But uh, first of all, who are you? What do you do? And quickly, what has your, been your big success for the last week, Joe? So uh, my big success for the last week was I did a wonderful event workshop last week uh, where I had three panelists. And for anybody who doesn't know me, I am a, a speaker, coach, and uh, author of three books all around the area of relationship marketing and mindset. And the workshop I did last week was a fantastic uh, event. It was about uh, helping people that are going into this last quarter it was, uh, I had a panel that was, you know, just really focused on marketing and how to, you know, market in alternative ways, where to find some clients outside of your target market and how to build referrals and referral relationships outside of where you're usually uh, fishing for those referrals. And uh, it was very well received. So I was, I've, been, I've been riding that high since last Tuesday. That's great. Do you have a partnership with any of the panelists we have on, on today? Have you met or spoken with them? Well, um, Jenny and I have been talking for the past couple of years about doing a workshop together. So I think we're going to need to get that one done. So there's one potential partnership. And then uh, both Dominic and Clint are both buddies of mine, uh, as is you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, Dominic and I just had coffee together a couple of weeks ago. So. I remember on a we first got together about five years ago and had lunch and, and talked about yes. you know, deep referral relationships and how we can help one another. Some of the people you should be, you know, talking to as well on this. Uh, well, I've heard Arlene, we're going to get to Arlene in a minute. And I just heard a minute about what you do and I wanted you on. So, so I thought that was really cool. But um, I, I want to introduce you to, uh, well, Gene Volpe is great. You want to reach out to Gene Volpe, but I also want to introduce you to Rhonda Share. Now, Rhonda, Hi, Rhonda. Share, Rhonda Share is the LinkedIn consultant for Rockstar Connect. Cool. She knows everyone and anyone all around the country and can make so many introductions to you and vice versa. And I think you guys can make some money together. It's I love a, it. That's not a bad thing, right? No. <laughs> that's wonderful. I like that. Well, Rhonda, why don't you tell a little bit about yourself and uh, share your successes for the week? Awesome. Well, nice to meet you, Joe. Yeah, I'd love to, um, to connect with you. So I am a LinkedIn strategist. I like to say I get people out of the LinkedIn witness protection program, showing them how to <clears throat> generate two to 10 appointments a week and an additional 10,000 to hundreds of thousands of dollars potentially using LinkedIn. Um, my successes, though, I actually owe all to Rockstar, actually, Stephen, because Last week, uh, Greg McDaniel was in the second hour of Rockstar, and Greg McDaniel was the one that helped me to find Rockstar. I heard Greg on a podcast, and they asked Greg, what's your best resource? And he said, Rockstar Connect. And I went and looked it up and found you, Stephen, and you know, the rest is really history, but Greg and I ended up on a Zoom call for two hours, like you know, exchanging resources, and you know, I'm referring him, and he's referring me, and I mean, it was amazing. So that was phenomenal. And then um, on a personal note, um, my daughter, my daughter who'll be 31 next month, I don't know how that happened, but my 31 year old will be home today from Denver because we're moving um, to Carlsbad from the Murrieta Temecula area. So we, she's got a wedding with one of her friends and so she's coming to clean out her stuff. So both of my daughters are gonna be home today, which is really exciting. And yesterday was our 40th wedding anniversary. So it's all good. That's, that's <laughs> fantastic. So, you know, it's funny because Greg introduced you to Rockstar Connect, but I think it took, you know, a couple of years for me to get the two of you on the phone together. Well, I actually did Greg's profile, which was really funny. He had hired me and I totally forgot. And then I looked at his profile and I'm like, oh, I did that, <laughs> which was really funny because I've done so many of them. But we had the most amazing conversation and I really owe it all to you, Stephen, because if he had not shown up, I would not have 
sent him a message in the chat that said, oh my gosh, it's you, let's reconnect. Here's my calendar. And we spent two hours on Zoom. It was incredible. So, so anyone out there who's listening, you know, take the opportunity to connect with uh, Joe and Rhonda and Greg. And, and Greg and Jean are very, you know, they're very close to one another. They, they've been doing podcasts together for, well, how long have you and, and Greg been? I did his profile in 2017. And right after that was when I connected with you. With me, right. Jean, how long have you been working with Greg? Uh, I've been on that, on the Real Estate Uncensored podcast with him now for, it's got to be over two and a half years. How many people watch that? That's a huge podcast. My, uh, what I'm getting out of that is they get 40,000 downloads a month. That's tremendous. I mean, yeah, whenever, it's a good, good show. Our phone starts ringing whenever he mentions our name on the show. And we're really grateful when he does. And uh, Gene, Gene uh, you know, has helped Greg a lot and vice versa. And that's what, it, that's what it's all about. For sure. Yep. But, uh, let's go over to Clint. Hey, what's up, Stephen? So, so when, when I get my studio all set up, I think who, whoever does it's going to come over to your house too. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, I'm just sitting in front of my porch. So I mean, yours, sometimes it really works and sometimes yeah. it doesn't. That natural light is great. Yeah. And, and sometimes you can, you know, I mean, I can see your face great today, but other yeah. times it could just be like a black shadow. Yeah, if it gets a little cloudy outside, it gets a little uh, grayish, that's for sure. Yeah, so we'll come back to, to Gene and Jeff on this and talk a little bit about home, give you an opportunity to talk about home studios before we go to the second hour and what your opinions are on that. And of course, I'm sure Jenny will want to add in a little bit on that as well. Dominic always looks great, so I don't know what he does, but whatever he does, he does with precision. And that's everything in his life. Okay, so Clint, uh, what is what has been your success in the last week? Um, so a couple things. Uh, so first of all, you guys don't know me. My name is Clint Webb. I work for Coeco um, Office Systems and, you know, I'm just a, a problem solver in the document solutions business. So I guess that's the best way to, uh, to put it. Um, successes for the week. So personal is staying on this uh, last 90 day challenge, which has been huge for me uh, in the last, I don't know, I guess six months or so, because I did the one at the beginning of the year. So that was amazing. Um, and signed another contract this morning. So on the, on the business side, so that makes four in the last week and a half. So pretty excited about that. Uh, but yeah, that was, uh, that's been my success so far. That's true. I mean, I've heard about a lot of people, you know, writing deals. And we're going away, you know, on this trip for a couple of days. And one of my, you know, someone who was referred to me from this panel, uh, from someone in California, the client is actually in Fort Lauderdale. I spoke on the phone with them. They didn't even know where they were going to move in the country. And I, I sort of convinced them, you know, being someone from South Florida, North Carolina is not a bad place to land if you're moving from South Florida. And she called me uh, yesterday and said, I sold my house in Fort Lauderdale. I'm coming up this weekend to buy a house. I thought, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? We're going on vacation. So we are coming back a day early and I will sell her a house uh, this weekend. So for those of you who don't know what's going on in real estate right now, uh, there's a big interest in purchasing new properties, whether that be you know, uh, primary homes, people downsizing, upsizing, they're taking that opportunity. But people are also buying vacation homes and uh, second homes in areas like the mountains of North Carolina, where a home would be on the market for, for 1,250 days, they go on the market and they sell immediately. So in our industry now with our clients in real estate, we have to be very responsive to them uh, and say, today we are going out to buy a house. Are you prepared to buy a house? Uh, and, and all the people that are responsible for helping them to do that, you know, they're going to call their financial advisor like Dominic, or they're going to call, you know, a lender to find out if they're ready. But in real estate right now, you have to act immediately. It's probably one of the, the biggest years in real estate since I've been in it. And I think this, this month, I've been in real estate 10 years this month. It's been a, a full decade of selling real estate. And they said it wouldn't last. Uh, Arlene. Uh, welcome to the show. This is uh, your first time and yes. you do something different and unique where you help small businesses uh, to achieve what they want to do, help them grow or help them start. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do? Okay. So I help authors and coaches and entrepreneurs and businesses 
um, get sponsorship money, large sums of sponsorship money that they don't have to pay back and that they can use to grow their business. So what we do is we start locally, build a base, and then many of the companies have corporate, national corporate offices. So we have a smooth transition from going from local to the court, to the national or even international level. Wow, that's pretty amazing. And, and how did you think up this business? How long have you been doing it? Oh my goodness, that's a whole nother story. <laughs> um, I've been doing it as a business for about two years. And I'll be speaking later, so I'll tell you my story, how I got into it, because it'll take too long to tell you now. Um, but it's been, yeah, it's, it's something a little different that people haven't realized they can get sponsors, because most people think, you know, like Katie, what Katie does is works with nonprofits. So a lot of people think sponsorship is the same as a donation from a nonprofit. But but it's not. It's it's a little different, and I show them the difference and how to you know how to do it. Well, sponsorship is a big part of our model, and we're always looking for more sponsors. So I'm sure Sarah mm -hmm. and I will be jumping on a call with you. Uh, Great. To discuss that as well. We think we have a large audience of people that sponsors like to get in front of, or so we've been yes. told. So Arlene, what has been your great success uh, for the week? Um, well, my business success is. I've been working one-on-one -on -one with people, but I decided to start doing a workshop. My first one's going to be a pretty small workshop, and I signed up three people this week. So that was good. And my other success is I'm really involved with the environment and nature, and I feel like it's my success because last spring we had an eagle's nest, that had two baby eagles and just the other day the mother came back to rebuild the nest so they're going to have another uh, another nest in the same tree and it's pretty exciting to see what they went through to keep that nest safe it was it i never realized what eagles go through it's so i you know at one of my community pages uh, i was able to someone supplied me with a photo of two eagles flying together, two bald eagles. Uh -huh. And someone who was much more on the nose said, you don't really see two adult bald eagles together unless they're doing one thing. <laughs> Making baby yeah. bald eagles. And they do that you know, up in the air at full blast. Uh -huh. So that ended up being the cover page of my community page, basically, uh, I guess, bald eagles fornicating. <laughs> That's but as a social as a social media post, nature is is something that people really appreciate. It it calms them, and I think people are having a little bit more understanding of nature. I'm having uh, less uh, seeing less posts about let's kill kill copperheads than let's relocate them. You know, people yeah. are a little bit before they're saying you know just kill those animals that we live with. Uh, Arlene, who, who do you, does anyone here think that they would benefit from, their business would benefit from someone who's an expert in sponsorships? I don't know about my business, but I certainly think that uh, my wedding reception could benefit from some sponsorship. <laughs> Which I'm, trying to, I'm trying to turn it into a music festival. It's oh. completely corporate sponsored. You want to help me do that? If, you're, if your sure. wife... Are, and your actually... Wife are, uh, Actually, your business could get sponsors too. You, everyone thinks they can't get sponsors because they think sponsorships are only for nonprofits. But I, I think I think uh, Finner and the SEC might disagree with that uh, for my particular business. However, <laughs> we, can, we can get uh, we could get that that wedding sponsored. That's a all right. Story. We'll talk. I have a, all right. Uh, I could do it for the because we do sponsor. We use sponsors for the for our podcast. So yes. Yes. we are always looking for more sponsors like Steven and, but that's how we run our platform for girls to do stuff is on 100% with sponsors. But we do know we just had a guest on who got her wedding sponsored um, almost 100%. So I will happily share what she said, Dominic. Yes, yes, I told yes. Heather about it. She didn't tell you. No, she did not. <laughs> I mean, I don't know every wife that would allow their, you know, their wedding to be sponsored, but. But she doesn't want to have to plan it, so she's giving it. it to me, and <laughs> she, she's going to be surprised. 
Well, I get sponsors for my events every month. So um, I already sent you a connection request, Arlene, uh, on uh, LinkedIn. So yeah, let's we'll, we can chat offline about that. And I definitely like to connect. Um, I mean, I can always learn more about sponsorships, but just also with my LLC, with my online course, um, I'm, you know, if there's a way to get sponsors to support that, um, I would, I would love that. And I want to start a podcast. I, I talked to Jenny about it a while ago. I just haven't done it yet. So just all those things. Um, so I'll definitely connect with you. Oh, good. So Thank you. I'll put Arlene, my information so in the chat right now. Okay. Jean I'll put and Arlene do not know what your charity is, Katie. So they're at a disadvantage and Joe probably doesn't know either. I don't. Um, so we provide bikes to disadvantaged children, but it's not just a couple kids. It's every single kid in the whole school. So we're giving like 500, 600 bikes at once, and they're all custom bikes. So they're not just random bikes that, you know, people donate. It's, um, you know, we, we name the bikes. We, they're, all, they're always white, and then every year we switch out a neon color. We switch out the name. We put our logo on it. If we have a sponsor that funds all of the bikes, we'll put their logo on it. It's um, it's pretty cool. We give them to the give them to all the kids at once in big surprise bike reveals. So they're all covered with tarps, and all the kids come outside. And they have no idea why they're out there, and then we have you know hundreds of volunteers, and we pull up the tarps, and they you know freak out. It's really cool. <laughs> uh, it's what I think is great is you know everyone gets the same high quality bike. They're not mm -hmm. getting a junker. They're not getting right. a hand me down. It's maybe one of the first new uh, possessions of these some of these kids have ever had, and maybe right. the most valuable thing in their entire household. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it, there's like you know three, four, five kids in a house that all go to that school and they all just get got a bike together, or it's a child in foster care and their whole life has just been ripped out from under them and they just get a bike. You know, it's, so it's it's great that we're able to provide this for so many kids. It provides family time that didn't always exist before because parents don't always, don't always know what to do with their kids when they don't have any money, they don't have a car, they don't know what, how to spend family time. So this gives them something to do with their kids. So it's, um, it's, really, it's really fun and a life-changing experience to be at a Biker Real witness it firsthand. Well, that's terrific. And I think that I, we're gonna be making a lot of connections from, uh, from people on this show. Um, Jean and Jeff and Jenny, I'm going to let you guys share some, some tips for the people out there that are now doing Zoom webinars and things like that from their home. Uh, why don't we start with, uh, with Jeff? Any, any tips you have for us? Sure. Um, start with good lighting. Wow. Look at that. So <laughs> this is, this is the setup I use and Sarah and I have spoken about this briefly. Um, I'm using more professional grade equipment because I have it, but honestly, anybody can set up lighting in their house using conventional LED or, or even CFL um, lights and just putting what we call um, diffusion fabric or something to make that light soft. The biggest thing about lighting a subject for any kind of video project is producing soft lighting. So this light up here, this light up here, it all has diffusion fabric over it. And uh, I don't know if you noticed in the shot, but there's actually two different cameras pointed at me. I have my A camera looking straight at me, and then so you can't tell that I'm not actually paying attention. My camera too, I can look all over the place and you don't necessarily know that I'm not staring straight at the camera anymore, and it helps you take your attention off the fact when I look off camera. And then all of that's running through a, a, a little hub. but. You don't need really expensive cameras. You don't need really expensive lighting. You can do this with really good 1080p um, webcams, but those webcams need a lot of light. So my suggestion is, and I can, I can send a link out to everybody on a video of a guy who actually puts together these soft boxes using CFL bulbs and his own little DIY tricks. But uh, on Amazon, these, these boxes or these what we call soft boxes are not very expensive. And remember that photography, videography is nothing more than the art of capturing light. So the more light you put on a subject, the better it is. That's my two cents. And we really appreciate that Enrich in our last uh, few three martini in-person uh, luncheons has uh, provided us with excellent lighting for the event, but also uh, taken uh, videos of the events, photos, as uh, well as, as testimonials. 
I know everyone is waiting uh, for the announcement of when the next event will be. We'll be doing that shortly. We will be having an event here in Raleigh and uh, another one in Charlotte. It's just making sure that they aren't occurring at exactly the same time so Sarah and I can, can go to both because uh, we have not figured out how to split ourselves in half quite yet. Uh, maybe, Gene, you can tell us how we could do that. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> but I, I will say what Jeff just gave you was not two cents worth. That was a, a $2,000 uh, tutorial real quick. That was brilliant. A lot of real easy tricks, but important things. So one of the things that I wanted to add to it a lot of times is camera placement. And we're, we're talking – you're talking podcasts, which are typically stationary, but video in general, I noticed what a lot of people like to do is let everybody on the feed look up their nose. And I always tell people when we, when we talk about training them, if I was to walk into a room and have a conversation with you while I'm standing up and you're sitting down, man to man, you're probably going to stand up to make eye contact with me. That's sort of the way you need to look on camera. I want to be looking at you, not down at you. So just a real simple tool, real simple trick to make it more watchable. I think you're going to find that if you do a lot of videos that are either way too high or way too low, aside from the fact you'll see my fifth chin, um, people, people don't take, take to that subconsciously very well, and they'll tune out quicker than, than if you are eye level with them. And I see it so frequently, what you're talking about, that shot up the nose, uh, especially, even with people that are very experienced and do a lot of podcasts, for some reason, they're shooting right up their nose. Yep. Uh, well, that, maybe they'll watch this and they'll, they'll know better now. <laughs> Jenny, your tips. So um, a couple of things. First, I'm going to say it's prime day. So today and tomorrow are the days if you want to invest in some lighting for not a whole lot of investment. Today and tomorrow would be the days. And then um, also Black Friday. And um, there's a couple other days throughout the year where they have really good uh, watch the lightning deals. Um, because even if um, you don't understand exactly what you're getting, <laughs> you can get away with finding a really good lighting kit that has a couple of, like, look for the buzzwords, like Jeff was saying, softbox um, or umbrella or um, even the ring lights. So I got... Um, a really great ring light. That's what I usually use at my desk. Um, Y'all saw what happened when my daughter closed the front door. This is 100% natural light today. <laughs> so natural light can work when you're angled correctly. If I move this way, it's going to change, right? So there's a couple things. Um, eye level, I love to use just a box to throw my laptop on. Um, and because otherwise, I, I y'all don't need to see up my nose and like whatever else is happening. Um, but the other thing is that you can turn your phone into a webcam. So if you have um, a subpar webcam on your computer and you can't find or you don't know which webcam to go look for, um, there's an app called um, Epic Cam. It's E-P-O-C-C-A-M. And it's $8. And it will turn your computer into a webcam. And it uh, you can do 1080p. It all it does all the things. I just because I'm home, the little one will likely come over and grab my phone at some point, and that would have gone bad. <laughs> so I didn't and, use it today. And you could get a stand for that as yep. well. Um, yeah, and I actually what I do is I have a pop socket, and I will hang it on the top of my laptop, so it's right at eye level, and I put it right where the camera is, and so I just hang the on the back of the pop socket but you can get a little tripod for that if you need to um or a ring light that has a tripod in it so so you have two kids and they're they're doing the virtual they're doing yes. the virtual classrooms right Correct. yes so do you think that if we do this for our children too to create a little better space for them to broadcast themselves do you think mm -hmm. that'll be their esteem or they'll perform a little bit better um, well, I can tell you, so I will bring, uh, my nine-year-old comes with me sometimes to my office and sets up in one of the conference rooms or one of the other spaces and he, you know, gets himself all settled. Um, at home, we do have lighting for him. Um, I have a <laughs> surprise. I have a little light set up for him. Um, but, uh, I think that, um, what it helps is the teachers more than the kids. Um, because one of the things, I don't think they care. But one of the things that's coming of this is that, you know, 
the first couple of months they were like, well, do we, are we supposed to turn our cameras off? Different teachers have different expectations. Some of the kids are turning their cameras off, some aren't. So um, what I'm hearing now from a lot of different parents is they're, all of the teachers are saying you have to keep your camera on while you're, you know, present in class. So um, I think it will help the teachers, <laughs> really, um, and help your relationship with the teachers should you um, get uh, some some decent lighting for them. And then there's also these little like selfie clip lights that you can get. I think mine is in my office. Um, it's like a little miniature ring light and you can just clip it. Um, it's, it's one that's supposed to fit on your phone, but you can just clip it. I used to use it all the time on my, on my uh, laptop and just clip it around the camera so that it just illuminates you. Cause you're not, you're not trying to illuminate your whole body, right? You're not trying to illuminate a large space. You're just trying to illuminate just right here. Um, so, so you can take a good 10 pounds off your face or mm -hmm. a little contouring, you know, do a makeup tutorial. I think camera thing would be great for my kids, you know, because sometimes Jeff isn't even really on the screen and it looks like he's on the screen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Something like that, my, my daughters would really appreciate. They, right. that, like that, just like what he did. Mm -hmm. He set it up and then come downstairs and have a snack, you know, have a martini, uh, whatever's available to them. And so I, I was thinking maybe, you know, it takes a little time to do this and it takes a little bit of, of money. Uh, but uh, the panelists that are interested in, you know, having better video, uh, would, would our experts here mind if, you know, they got an email with questions from, uh, and maybe in 30 days we come back on and we all look like we're on TV sets or, or something equivalent to that. I'd Thank be you. happy to, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So, uh, Same. Guys, Same. what do you think the yep. challenge should be, Dominic? Why don't you set the date that we're going to all have improved video by? Uh, okay. <laughs> what <date? laughs> two weeks from now? Two weeks. We're going to be gone for five days. Can you give us three weeks? <laughs> two weeks. I, I, like enough I, time. You need better video by the end of this uh, hour. <laughs> I, I agree. I mean, Clint, Clint and I were just like really needing it and it looks like joe it looks like his skin is the same color of the couch on his end so oh lighting help there his shirt jeff, looks great jeff get on this for i think days. that's more your screen steven not the not joe's couch <laughs> <laughs> be it. your monitor may need to be calibrated that's something else like people don't understand that like so what we see on our end like either the marketers and the photographers like what we see is going to be ending up different than what y'all see right. when you receive it because of the different calibration of the monitors and and things like that so well i bet rhonda and her new places can have an incredible studio because i don't know if you've seen her videos in the past you know she's in california has one of those california style apartments that you know homes that look great on camera i'm sure she'll be doing that in her new place correct rhonda yeah. Okay. You're all ready to go. And so who's ready for uh, the, the second half and uh, the question of the week? Well, I'm all paranoid about my video now and people seeing up my nose and being a black shadow. And well, I'm like, I know it's funny. You start your key. You look really good to start. I mean, you still look good. You still look great, but the lighting changed as it's progressed. And I see you moved a little bit to get back in, into the light. But that's the beauty of a, a cohort like this because we all do want to look as professional as possible. And we're able to reach out to one another in order to do that. And not just in, you know, in our video, but in our business and you know, mm -hmm. how our LinkedIn looks. You know, um, you know, Joe Navarro, follow up. You know, that's our biggest problem. You know, we might be great connectors. The follow up is bad. He has a system that mm -hmm. he teaches to do that. Uh, many of us want to you know, be involved with not-for-profits, Katie, you know, Jeff, you know, with his experience in video and Gene, you know, is nationally known uh, uh, coach in, in getting people to do that video. I mean, there, there's a reason why, why Greg is as great as he is because he knows that if he doesn't show up, Gene's going to be there without him. <laughs> right. You know, so that's part of it. All right. So here is, we're going we're gonna to possibly go into two questions today, but we're going to start with one. And the first question is, what impression do you think you give when you first meet someone? And I, I thought this was a great question because this has probably changed for you. You maybe had the way you thought people thought of you when you were in, in high school and then the way people thought of you in college. And then maybe when you just started off uh, working, 
And then later on, you know, when people started considering you, you know, an expert in your field. So here's the question once again, what impression do you think you give when you first meet someone? And let's start with, with Jean, one of the, the new panelists. Wow. That's a, <laughs> that's a we really, really easy questions. We don't you know. Any... That's a tough one. I, listen, I like to give myself the benefit of the doubt and think that I'm unimposing and I, and I'm, and I'm a listener and I have a warm, um, like I, I have, hopefully I, I, when I, I don't come across as, as how I do when you really get to know me. Um, I'm always in trouble when I'm with my wife because I have no filter. I say what's on my mind. Uh, one of my favorite quotes from a song is, uh, I won't tell you a lie, so be careful what you ask me. Um, so I, I know over time, my personality, I'm from Philly, so my personality can grate on people. You either love me or you can't stand me. But the first impression, man, that's a tough one. I, I would really like to think that I come off as interested, caring, um, and, and a decent listener. That's what I'm hoping. Well, I can tell you what my first impression was when I first saw, because I knew I was going to be on a podcast with you. Okay. I think we were on a podcast with someone from Viral Marketing. Okay. Together with, maybe with Frank, I don't, I don't remember. But I watched a few podcasts with you first. And the way my impression was, this guy really, really knows his stuff. He's an expert, and I don't want to flub it. I want to be prepared when I go on this so that I you know, can be seen as an equal expert. So I would say the first impression that you give is someone who's extremely competent and knows his craft. I, I'm humbled. Being, Thank you. For those of you that, that have seen him for the first time, is that sort of the impression that you got a lot of confidence? That great. That, that's my first impression. So, well, first of all, thank all of you right now. And if, if you don't mind, could we record this real quick so I can show this to my wife? It is, <laughs> it is being recorded just for your information. Very good. Thank you very much. <laughs> that, but that was, that was my first impression. And thank also you, it to the people that you surround yourself with as well. Right. right? You, you, you're with, you know, people that are, you know, persuasive and intelligent and they value your opinion. So that I think helps everyone's first impression when you hang out with good people. And that's part of net part of networking as well. And you don't just get that yet. You have to deserve it. Like when we have people come onto this panel, uh, Sarah's interviewing them and I'm in the background, like scrutinizing the interview <laughs> to make sure that we have some people that bring something good to the table. So Arlene, you passed the test. <laughs> uh, Clint, let's, let me ask you the, the same question. What impression do you think you give when you first meet someone? Um, well, you know, Stephen, I, I'm the same person no matter what. Um, I talk to my daughter the same way I talk to you guys, right? So, and so it's like, I just try to be the same real person. Um, I'd like to say I come off with confidence because of that. Um, and I don't really have a filter, I guess. So that could be a a good thing and a bad thing. <laughs> uh, so, but I think, I think that I come across as just a real person, or at least I would hope so. Well, let me, let me tell you what, oh, we lost Katie. Well, hopefully she'll come back. Uh, my impression the first time, time meeting you was that this someone is someone who is very giving and he's a servant because immediately you make yourself available uh, when you speak to people, you're automatically saying, this is, you know, this is who I am. This is what I do. You're not asked. You don't do any ask at all. Mm -hmm. I would say. Nope. So that was the impression that I have. So Dominic, did you I appreciate have a similar, that a similar impression of Clint when you met him? Oh man, my impression of Clint when I first met him, um, I just felt like he was a laid back, you know, real person regular you know he he wasn't trying to impress he was just being himself and that's you know it, it, and he hasn't changed from the day i met him so he's just always i, I just think he's always that gosh well, i appreciate that. the opposite of what he told me when i asked him <laughs> before the show okay uh dominic yeah what impression do you think you give when you first meet someone um sincerity Right. Just, um, you know, cause when I meet someone, I'm, I'm not much for small talk, chit chat, just to, you know, just to make conversations. So we have one, I I'm, I'm ready to get like in deep 
right away and actually understand who somebody is that I'm talking to and be present there with them. And, you know, not just waiting for my turn to, to talk. I can go entire conversations we're chatting about and I don't ever talk about myself just because I, I just really want to know about that person, right? Uh, that I'm meeting for the first time. And that's sincere. And I think that that, that comes off. And I've had, uh, you know, folks tell me that. And then people get to know me a little bit and they, they know I'm, I'm, I'm silly. I get a sense of humor. I like to, you know, cut up and, and joke and talk about food and drink and everything else. And some of the, some of the panelists that are meeting me for the first time today are discovering that rather quickly with this little uh, game we're playing uh, on the panel that the attendees don't really know that's going on, but you know, it's a, it, it's a good time. I like to, you know, if, um, you know, ultimately when you do, like I said, get to know me, you realize that, uh, you know, I'm like Clint sincere, regular, and I am who I am. Well, I, I would, you know, because I can give you only the impression I had of you the first time. It's very similar to what you said, and I'll focus on one part of it. You ask a lot of questions in a good way, which points to your seriousness. So I think that when you are, when you are asking those questions, you're setting the tone uh, for the relationship. And that relationship, whatever that may be, whether it ends up being friendship, or business what's whatsoever and it's all it's almost a deep dive uh to determine what is the other person's needs to see if you are going to fulfill it whether that's going to be a casual relationship or whether it's going to be a serious uh, friendship or business relationship but it is definitely the questions and i remember meeting you uh, you know in north raleigh at an event and uh, you had very specific you know questions uh, for me and i knew that uh, uh, it was to, to my benefit to answer those questions, and it, it certainly was. So I would say you're the, the grand inquisitor. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Can I add to that, Stephen? Because I have yeah, something to piggyback to that. I would, I would echo everything Stephen just said. Um, you just, you present like yourself as a, like you're actually genuinely concerned about what their problem is and how to solve it. And your questions are very pointed um, and um, very intentional. So, and when you ask pointy questions, you're going to get, you're going to get good answers. So it's a, a great way to model yourself. Uh, you know, if you are looking to establish a deep referral relationships, uh, that perhaps it's good to ask questions about the other person uh, first. Rhonda Cher is, is very good at this. Uh, she does the same, she does the same thing. So you have to understand that Rhonda is also a face reading expert. Uh, and she teaches a course on that as well. So when she's asking the question, she's reading your face, but she doesn't have to see your face necessarily to do that. She can tell by the tone of your voice when she's on the phone with you, et cetera. But what impression do you think you give when you first meet someone, uh, Rhonda? I think for me, it's um, knowledgeable that I know LinkedIn so well that I, I tell people things that to me seem so obvious. And they're like, you know, like an example might be, you know, you realize you have your privacy settings set in a way that you're sending people to your competitors. And they're like, what are you talking about? And I just show them how to switch that. So I think part of it is um, that I come off as knowledgeable. And then when I do read the faces, then they just think you're either weird, a psychic or something. <laughs> you know, like they just think it's really weird. Um, actually had that happen the other day where I was reading somebody's face and it, actually it was Greg McDaniel and I and then he said okay well here's my girlfriend read my girlfriend and that that was just so funny he's like oh my god you're like totally psychic this is really weird and I'm like no I'm just reading your face I said she has to have everything in place and he looks at me he goes do you know what she does I, I said I have no idea what she does he said she's an anesthesiologist I'm like, she better have everything in place because people are putting their lives in, their, in her hands. So I think those are the two things that for me, um, and sometimes I think I'm, I'm a little bit too straight. You know, I, I, don't, I don't sweet talk things and I don't soften the edges a lot. I'm just really straightforward. So maybe sometimes the way I come across is abrupt, although it's not, it's just that I'm I've honest. never heard anyone say that about you. And you know, I've spoken to many people that have met you for the first time. No one has ever said that. 
I will say that uh, you were immediately in your first impression able to establish yourself as part of, of a team or the team and as a colleague. And, uh, you know, it was interesting where you said how we had met and we were introduced to one another. I don't really remember any of that because I just assume it, you, the way you present yourself, it's as if you're a friend immediately. So you just feel like that friendship could be 20 years old, 30 years old. So I would say that first impression is, is a, as someone who cares 100%. And you know, Joe. You know, this is what he writes books about. Uh, let's jump. Look, let's jump over to Joe. What impression do you think you give when you first meet someone? And I want you to take it a little bit further. Has that changed over the last ten years? Um, yeah. I mean, when people first met me, we'll say ten years ago, I was much more shy, so I was trying a lot harder. So let's, so let me put it that way. So I was trying hard to overcome that. So I think that I could sometimes be more in your face, but that doesn't mean that I still wasn't very genuine and kind to people. And I do think that that is how I come across. I'd like to believe that that's how I come across as two things as kind and encouraging, because uh, that is really how I feel. I, my, I feel like my life mission is to encourage the uh, discouraged. And, uh, you know, but it, through business, through sales and marketing and teaching them how to always feel encouraged uh, in, in that way. And I, I want to just say I agree with you 100% about Clint. The first time I met Clint, Clint was like trying to figure out how he could uh, introduce people to me. We had only met for like two minutes and he was already like, okay, I got this person, this person, this person. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You know, Joe, I was going to say when I, the first time we met, we had lunch with Denise yep. um, at the restaurant in Hillsborough. And it was uh, you, you were honest. And I think more, moreover, you were vulnerable because you were able, willing to tell a complete stranger somebody your story. Okay. And I love that about you. Cool. Thank you. I, I would say, and, and I mean this in the kindest way, your first impression is uh, emotionally vulnerable. In, in, in a good, and I mean that in, in the best way, meaning that you do care, that you do expect to hear someone's story because you are, you allow yourself to be vulnerable. People will share stories with you. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can talk to Joe and Joe will tell you, man, people tell me stuff. I can't believe that they tell me that, but I feel honored that they share that, mm -hmm. share that with me because they, because you allow your, in your first impression to be vulnerable they're willing to share a lot with you. And I guess that's part of, you know, the deep referral relationship. Is that something that you teach? Well, I do. I don't ever want somebody to do anything that makes them uncomfortable. And I want people to be, to be authentic. Uh, but at the same time, I believe that we, we have to put ourselves in positions where we're safe where we want to work with people that we, that we're safe with. So, you know, I'm going to just use a quick example you know, I misunderstood something and I called a friend who, my friend Jenny last week, because I misunderstood something. And so I just asked her, hey, did I, did I screw up here? And she was like, absolutely not. But you know what, Jenny is, I felt safe enough in that relationship that I could pick up the phone and call her. And those are the kinds of people that we want to make sure that we're surrounding ourselves with. There are people, Stephen, who I will come into contact with. Well, I'll say, I want to be very, I want to keep what I say very close to the chest mm -hmm. because I know that, you know, there aren't, not everybody is uh, somebody you can feel that safe with. So that, but that comes with age as well. And I'm not joking when I say that, that really does come with age where we learn uh, sometimes, you know what, this isn't the right time to be fully transparent or this is somebody I need to be transparent with because they need to hear what I have to say. Um, so can I ask, can I ask you another question? I hate to put you on the hot seat, but you haven't been, been on since I think our very first one of these you were on uh, as a panelist. Uh, in the age of COVID, when people are having difficulties with their business, if they have a true, you know, uh, a true uh, relationship, business relationship with someone, should they be comfortable enough to say, hey, these are our challenges can we have assistance with that challenge? Is it, is it okay to ask at that point? And at what point in the relationship can you do that? Now, when you say asking about their challenges, are you talking about with their clients or with other, like somebody's well, on this call today? 
they're challenged with their own business, you know, uh, with revenue or, or making. Absolutely. Revenue. I mean, there's, you should have, I would say you should have people that are your uh, circle, your close circle that you should feel, you know, advisors or like, I get the impression just from what I'm seeing that like Clint, Dominic, um, Scott Rudder, you know, a few, a couple of other guys, like I'm willing to bet that they probably know things about them. And I think Jenny's in that group too, that they know things about each other personally and professionally that many of us don't know. And so it's really important in our business, in our business relationships, they've got to go beyond just being business. And that's where, you know, that's where we do the deep dive. And it's in that deep dive that where we can or share these things with each other. And because uh, sometimes there are things that I've shared with other people where I just couldn't see the forest for the trees. And somebody was able to say, Joe, it's really this simple. Here's the answer. And it's like, you know. Well, that's, that's, I can see that. That's like one of my superpowers. If someone actually tells, if I can determine what their needs are, I can satisfy a lot yeah. of their wants. That's why I connected you with Kevin recently because I knew Kevin he had a need and I knew, and I had a feeling that if he spoke to you, you'd be able to help him with that. Well, I, I hope I was able to help him. Thank you for being on the show, Joe. We'll, we'll talk to you a little bit Thank later. Thank you all. Uh, John, John and Sean have joined us. Uh, I'm glad to see you again, John. I heard that uh, you know, Tim Jones, who is uh, you know, someone very important in your company, he came down with COVID. I hope he's recovering. Yes, uh, he uh, he and his wife and his father-in-law all um, came down with COVID and were all br briefly hospitalized. So I'm, I'm happy to report they're all back home, um, but they are going to be in a lengthy recovery process. So your continued thoughts and prayers are, are appreciated. Thank you, Stephen. Well, uh, we, we do pray for him and his family to recover a hundred percent. And uh, we're glad that you're back on, on the show. Uh, is the beard back? Was the beard not here last week? I can't it, remember. It, it, it is. Uh, it is. Um, and, and it's, it's the COVID beard. I mean, you know, I don't, I, I spend most of my time in front of a camera these days. So you'd think I'd be uh, a little bit more well kept, but um, it's, it's just too much fun to grow hair and then shave hair, grow hair and shave hair. And if, my face is the only place I can do it. Yeah, and the razors are so much better today than when we were, you know, just growing our facial hair. Uh, Tuesdays yeah. is my shave day, unless I have a client that I'm meeting and then then I do shave. But Tuesdays, <laughs> I have a pretty full beard uh, right before this panel uh, every single week. So uh, John is, is a, a storyteller, and that's how he, he connects with other people. He loves to tell stories about his life, about about people in his life in order to connect. So the, the question this week, John, and we'll jump in, jump in with you and then we'll come to everyone else. Everyone will get an opportunity is what impression do you think you give when you first meet someone? <laughs> oh man. Did my wife make you say that? Yes, she um, did. I could tell you exactly what impression I give most people when I first meet them. Cocky, arrogant, uh, overconfident. Um, are you kidding me with this attitude? Um, I, it, it's just one of those things that once you really fully understand and appreciate who you are, what you, what you bring to the table, what you want to be, and, and more importantly, what you're not going to be, you, you have a, a level of, of confidence, and I'll use that word, that that other people sometimes can it can be off-putting to other people because they expect you to have insecurities and doubts and and empathies and sympathies that you just it, it, that may be a little different um so when when i first meet people they they generally have to get to know me a little bit to know that i'm not really that much of an egotist um, that i really don't think i'm the smartest person in the room and that i don't think i can solve every problem but i certainly want to have that level of confidence and that's what they see. Well, there, there's a, you know, there's a fine line between arrogance and confidence and mm -hmm. people that are known for their confidence, they're always riding that line. And you have to make a determination whether you want to put that confidence out there. 
usually people that do that are leaders and they have followers that need that confidence from them because it's not easy to be to be that way to be border of arrogance because some people are not going to like you but guess what usually over time they come to like you so i uh go go ahead <laughs> john well what i was going to say and 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 the way that i de uh, uh, delineate that is a confident person will admit when they're wrong an arrogant person will never admit they're wrong and I, you know, one of the, you know, when I'm having a discussion with one of my agents and we're getting into it, we're going back and forth quite often, I'll say, please, please prove me wrong. You know, this is my opinion and I want you to prove, I'm not, I don't, I'm not, I'm not trying to argue with you. I just want you to prove me wrong so that, you know, because educate you. Yeah. Uh, you know, and so I think that's, I think that's a great, great uh, insight there. Stephen. And I think that, that, that fine line comes between, can you admit when you're wrong or can you easily adapt another's point of view? If you can handle those two things, you can navigate that fine line pretty well. I think that uh, I agree. And I think that sometimes people with confidence, they, they have a real chameleon like ability, whatever organization they're with, whatever they're doing, they can change, you know, courses very quickly and have that leadership position. That's like their soup. That's their superpower. And not everybody is willing to step into that position and expose themselves to like potentially ridicule from some people. So, you know, I started off, uh, uh, you know, uh, with your CEO, Ed Moore over at mm -hmm. HPW here in Raleigh. And, uh, one day I remember my broker in charge took me and Sarah will tell you about this. Cause I came home. I had a big laugh on it. She said, you know, 50% of the people here in the company really absolutely dislike you. And I said, well, do the other 50% really like me? <laughs> I said, yes, they really do. And I said, well, I could become president of the United States. Those 50%, I was giving 100% to help them be successful and make myself available to them as a leader. Uh, for the other 50% that didn't like me, I kept the door open that we could always be friends. Because... Yeah you know, the, when they're ready for it, what you're willing to offer as a confident person like you, John, uh, they're going to come and they're going to be more successful. And people will leave organizations with confident people uh, then, you know, to try elsewhere. And then they come back to that same organization with a confident uh, producers who are going to mentor them and allow them to be successful. But uh, John, you know, great insight into how people perceive you. Uh, mm -hmm. Jacqueline uh, Wittenberg, Jackie. Hello. Hi, welcome. How are you today? I'm doing great, thank you. So you're you're just in time for a question I think you're going to love. You're going to oh, absolutely wow. love. What impression do you think you give when you first meet someone? And I would say that, frankly, John, you and I are very similar to one another. But more similar, or maybe Jenny, let's put Jenny in there too. Jenny, John, Jacqueline, and I were very similar. Jackie's going, huh? Okay, but <laughs> well, we'll come I to Jackie hope, in a moment. Um, but Jackie, what impression do you think you give when you first meet someone? I pray that I'm giving um, an inviting um, type of, of vibe to a person because I am very, I love people and I'm very open um, to talking to any and everyone. So I pray that that's being received from me, the same kind of energy that I am uh, warm and inviting. Uh, that's important to me because I do care about people um, deeply. And I understand uh, not everyone has that jovial personality about them, but I pray that that is the, um, the energy that I'm giving off when I meet people. You do absolutely. I, mean, I remember when you and I met and we hit it off you know, right away. But I would imagine that sometimes people are skeptical when you are open and friendly and with a big spirit. Correct. I actually had someone say that to me before. When I lived in New York, I had there was a business, a young business owner in town, and I would walk by her shop and I'd go in and I'd talk to her, and then I started. Uh, making regular purchases there because I loved her uh, fashion. She was a fashion merchandiser and I loved everything. And she and I became very, um, we engaged in conversation on a regular basis. And then one day she sent me an email and said, you know, this is not common around here. I've always felt that most people came in on regularly like that to talk to me 
they were eventually going to come back and ask me for something. And I was kind of stumped by that. But that's the, you know, that's the world she's lived in and the way she's perceived people for so long that she didn't think it was possible to have a um, friendship or to meet someone just solely based on, um, you know, building a, um, a great relationship, not wanting anything in return. And, but I do have to say it's, um, fast forward, it's 15 years later, and she's one of my dearest friends now. So when, when you do perceive that someone may be a little skeptical about, you know, why you're becoming their friend or, you know, of, of your great personality, how do you deal with that? Um, I am who I am. And, uh, you know, because they have those feelings, it doesn't change who I am as a person. So I can't change how they feel. I can only be who I am. And so I, you know, it, I can't allow that to bother me because it's not going to change anything. I'm always going to be the Jacqueline Wittenberg that I am. So, you know, uh, <laughs> that's how I deal with that. So it could be it's a it could be a matter of their trust, and over, those type of people may take more time. The only way I would feel different about that, Stephen, is if I gave a personal reason not to trust. And um, I do everything in my power not to to be that person. And if a person feels like they can't trust, and they bring that to my attention, I'll quickly let them know it was not intentional. Um, because that's never who I set out to be. I am who I am. I don't make any commitments or promises that I can't deliver on. And I think that's uh, the biggest part of making sure that, um, you know, you grow and um, build uh, friendships or relationships with people to where they can trust you. Don't ever um, insinuate or, or promise something that you can't uh, live up to. So uh, do you feel that the, the impression that you give now is the same as you gave at 20, or is it more accepted now? At this One stage? more time, please. Do you feel that you are more accepted now uh, at this stage of your life than you were in your 20s? Because your personality hasn't changed. You're the same way. Um, I don't see um, a difference in how people have perceived me through the years. Um, Either that or I haven't paid much attention to it. Um, but acceptance, um, for me, I'm more of a person who thinks about respect as opposed to acceptance. So if you respect me, I'm good with that. If you don't, if you accept me, that's great. But if you, but respect is the most important part because to me, respect equals perceptive from my view. Excellent. And, you know, so, John, I compared, you know, you to Jackie and to myself. Do you sort of see the similarities there? I do. I, I, I definitely do. I am, who I, I am who I am. I love it. Yeah, that upstate New York, man. I mean, we're, you know, it's, it's, it's like I said, you know, you must have talked to my wife, you know, she's, she, uh, she has the same attitude. She was born in Albemarle. I was born in upstate New York and there's personality differences. A hundred percent. Uh, Arlene, let's go to, let's go to you and we'll, we'll throw the question to you and then I'll throw it to, uh, Sean and then, then to Jenny. Okay. Uh, Arlene, what impression do you think you give when you first meet someone and you just met everyone here for the first yeah. time <laughs> so you can reflect on it? Well, I think I, I like to have fun. I like to enjoy life. Um, so I'm pretty happy. I don't think you should do things like your business. If you can't enjoy it and have fun, you should not be doing it. Um, I'm friendly and I know my subject. So I'm, I feel like I'm comfortable with myself and I'm confident. I wasn't always, I used to be shy, but now I feel like I'm, I'm just happy. <laughs> well, that's fantastic. And uh, Jackie, I'd like to introduce you to Arlene. Arlene has a company that helps uh, for-profits and not-for-profits find sponsorships, both locally. Hello, Arlene. <laughs> Hi, Jackie. <laughs> nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. And it's funny because you have not moved where you are located in your house. You're still in the exact same spot where you started. The lighting is perfect now. I, I did move over a little, a few inches, because the sun was coming through, and then I, I saw it and, and fixed it. Good. I'm glad I fixed it. I wasn't sure if I, if I did. Yeah, you, re you really nailed it. hundred percent. Good. 
Uh, Sean, what impression do you think you give when you first meet someone? That's, uh, that's again, a uh, hot kind of question, kind of what we'll, we'll test to see how much of an ego people have, I guess, depending on how they answer. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. I, I believe I give a, a nice impression, a pleasant impression. Uh, I'm a likable guy, I think. I've heard that from other people. So I, I'm i pretty straight up, pretty genuine, you know, and that's the impression that I think I give other people. That's what I think. That's what I hope. <laughs> Simple as that. Well, it's, you know, it's interesting because when I first met you, you were a teenager. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yet you gave a very professional impression was that just something that you had or is that something you had to learn or you were instructed to do i know your mother was your manager at the time did she teach that to you uh no actually i think i've always been an old soul and people told me that like ever since i was i don't know five six years old people always said oh you're acting like a grown-up why why do you want to do that why do you want to be like that and i always said that's just how i am i can't help it that's just how i am so when you say when you met me when I was a teenager and I was very professional, n not really. No, it wasn't like people were instructing me. It was just kind of, I don't know. If I'm in a professional environment, I take it seriously. I mean, I I'm aware that leaving a good impression is important, and it's even more important to pay mind to when uh, you are a younger person because there are so many assumptions that people make about young people. Um, just because there, there are a large percentage of them that don't care as much and so they get a bad rap. And so I just didn't want that to happen to me. I just wanted to be real straight and, and people respect that. I, I agree. And I think what's really cool that you had an experience at a young age that other people may not have had is you basically had a coworker, you had a manager. Mm -hmm. you know, so you had someone who was professionally representing you, which... I, I yeah. don't think anybody here had when they were in their teens. But the impression that you gave me is that you're a very thankful person. I, that you're thankful for opportunities. Absolutely. Yeah. No, man, man it, could, it could be, it could be so much, you know, my, on my worst day, I always think it could be so much worse. I, I have to look mm -hmm. around and look at what I have, look at what I've done in the, the short year that I've been around on this earth. And I go, okay, it's not so bad after all. It could have been a lot worse. It could have, I mean, there's so many other directions it could have gone, so I'm 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 quite happy with with everything up to this point. I, yeah, I, it's it's good to be happy and th and thankful for what we have and what we not what we think we're being denied. There are so many opportunities out there. Right. Uh, you know, you you, you got to buy the lotto ticket to win the lottery. You got to participate, and those tickets are being oh. thrown at us all the time. We just got to pick them up. Yeah. Sure. Uh, Jenny. What impression do you think you give when you first meet someone? Um, so I have been told that I am quite intimidating when people meet me, which I hear it and I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> I'm not intimidating. Um, apparently my RBF game is very strong. Um, and so I um, really work hard to keep a smile plastered to my face. Um, I know who I am. I am comfortable and confident in who I am. And um, the other piece of that is people don't know what to make of me because you know so many people run around with um, hidden agendas or they're unsure or they're insecure or whatever. And so that becomes like the, the baseline that people expect and I don't play games. I don't have time for it. I'm, I don't manipulate. I don't, you know, I mean, I can spin things, but that's because I'm a content creator. That doesn't mean that I'm, you know, allowing manipulative, whatever. But um, I was waiting for my husband to like come up from the peanut gallery over there. <laughs> He's going to say something because <laughs> he made I'm a face. I'm shocked but, he didn't. Um, but, um, but yeah, so um, I try to come across as inviting and warm and welcoming. Um, and I try to match that with the understanding that um, because I am who I am, that people don't always know how to take me. And so I just usually start by asking questions. 
and then see what happens. Well, there's something you said, you said confident. You know, that's, it's for people that are confident, sometimes it can be a challenge to meet other people because it doesn't, it doesn't fly for all people. But I think that for people that it does fly for, you're going to make the best, the best friends. You're going to make the best working partners. Uh, and the other people, they're, they're going to understand your value over a period of time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because um, once people get to know me, like they've actually, like that's how I learned this was people said to me, you know, when I met you, like I was really intimidated by you or I didn't want to approach you. It took me a while to reach out because I didn't know how to, how to take you. Um, the first time I heard it, I was like 22. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what, what 22 year old knows of being right? Like, I was like, are you like, do you even know what goes on in his head? Like if you do, <laughs> you would like run away, not be intimidated. Well, I, so I would frequently get that, that as well with my personality type people will say, Oh, when I first met you, I was so intimidated, you know, to come up to you and just like my wife just raised her hand. <laughs> you know, I'm such a serious person. And I'm not a serious person like that. Yeah, she, she said, you know, I was, you know, because I ran, a, I owned a bookstore and in the bookstore to all the people that were coming in, it looked like it was all fun and games, but that was by design. So the business would also be profitable as well. You know, so I ran it right. and worked in it and, you know, felt my wrath sometimes probably or lack of wrath, just fear of me. But, hey, can I add something to Jenny, Stephen? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so Jenny, I would agree that you come off confident and welcoming and inviting and i would say that people that can't handle the confidence that's not your loss so right. i say keep doing you boo and i'm glad that we're friends thank you Claire. you know it's uh, it's interesting though with people that they, they get it and they understand the confidence they're immediately know what you have to offer and they want it they want mm -hmm. lots of it all the other people that initially didn't get it over a period of time, you see them sort of coming over to the Jenny camp or mm -hmm. to the John camp over a period of time. And because of that, you don't stress about it because you know who you are, the confidence, and you know that eventually they're going to, to come to you because they, they, not that they need something from you, but you offer something that adds value in their life. John, what's, what's your thoughts on that? I, the thing that uh, came, came through my mind when you said that was um, competition. A lot of times people, when they meet you and you seem confident, they, see, they think that you're a competitor. And, and so then their shields come up and they're like, oh, no, 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 you know, I can't, I can't, you know, I can't warm up to this person. But once they realize that you are genuine and, and you have something to add a value, but you just do it, you just are self-confident. And your abilities, then it becomes a really great experience. Then it becomes collaborative, someone Man. they could collaborate yeah. with. And hey. that's my my core value. One of my core values is uh, collaboration and connection over competition. So that's like my that's how I live. Well, so, you, yeah, you know, Jenny, like John had a really good point there. Competition. So mm -hmm. you know, like confident women like you, like Jackie, on this panel, you're going to get a lot of women that are that think you're hard to approach or intimidating because you're because of your confidence, because you're their competition. You know, a lot of men think, you know, confident women are intimidating and just want to stay away from them if they're confident, you know, because they don't feel like they could do whatever they need to do. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. it's like, you know, I, you know, I don't, I don't envy women in that, in that aspect, because I think you guys get it a whole lot more than we do. And that's a typical Clint response in a good way. Uh, as far as, you know, competition, you know, it's, it's, in Rockstar Connect, we have events all over the country and we have real estate agents and financial service people. And some people will say, hey, I don't want any other real estate agents coming to my event. And that's automatically a red flag for us at Rockstar Connect because we feel like those people, they, they don't have the confidence to run these events properly because our best people are collaborative. They want to meet not only people not in their industry, but people in their industry so they can make relationships, so they can grow their companies, so that they can pass business that doesn't belong to them to other people. 
uh, and that's the beauty of being uh, confident. And I think that's important as a leader. And, and really, every one of our panelists, uh, whether they mentioned it or not, exude uh, exude confidence. And, and that I do appreciate. So I'm going to come over uh, to Jeff because you haven't had an opportunity to answer this question, Jeff. Do you have you? What impression no. do you think you give when you first meet someone? Well, like Jenny and some of the other people that have commented, I think I've heard every euphemism in the book for a hole. Um, <laughs> I've I've been in a leadership role for over fifteen years and um, had the I've had the benefit and the experience of making lifelong friendships with people that I literally uh, fought tooth and nail with at the beginning, and I've heard it all. My, most of my career that you really come across like an a-hole in the beginning, but once we get to know you realize that that it, that's really, um, I think, just the outward appearance of intensity and dedication. And I don't mind admitting that I'm a very intense person, but I, I don't really think I'm an a-hole. Well, that, that's a good thing. Has, did anyone think that Jeff was an a-hole when they met him? So I got two impressions from Jeff. Never. The, first, the first time was on a, on a, on a phone call on a phone call with him and he exuded confidence. You know, I'm a, a professional in what I do and this is the type of company I'm going into something that I have not done before, but I'm taking a skill set that I've developed over decades and applying it to this new world of virtual events. And uh, I mean, John, I mean, you should definitely be contacting uh, Jeff. He can add a lot to your virtual events. Uh, that that's his, his specialty to make these things more impactful, mm -hmm. especially the teams. And then uh, the second time that I spoke with you when there wasn't other people on the phone, I said, this guy's a real giver. You know, he, he shows a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, the strengths that other people that go to rockstar connect events have both the hosts and the attendees. And, you know, frequently, Sarah and I, people will contact Sarah and I, and they will offer us things. They'll offer to do things for us. And you would think that, oh, well, they must take every one of those offers. No, we're very, very particular because it has to be mutual. It has to help both parties uh, for it to be successful. And the, the person offering the services has to be of, of, of quality. We're not going to practice, uh, you know, with uh, with with a company that has, you know, over a hundred thousand uh, attendees coming to our events. So I would say that you gave a very good impression that we would, you know, we would want to connect with you and and do business with you. So in that regard, it was uh, fantastic, Dominic. I want to give you the last uh, word on this subject. You know, we've discussed. Did we ask you directly what what? you believe your first impression is we gave that yes okay our first let's let's take a little bit further our first impression is important yeah uh absolutely because you might not get a second one if the first one doesn't work out right so um you know i think the it, some sometimes you know the first impression is not correct, uh, but it that really only matters if you mess up your first impression, right? If you if you make a great first impression, but then you end up being a you know not a quality person, then you know that's that's a whole nother problem. Like sometimes people, it kind of kind of like first date, right? You, you're not really showing up as yourself. You're showing up as your as your advocate <laughs> and then the real you may come out later. Uh, but you know, when it, when it comes to business and, and the type of activity we do in networking, um, I think the first impression is important because as long as you're being yourself and the authentic version of who you are, then that first impression is going to gather the type of people that, uh, you, you want to reach, right? So I think, I think people, uh, people attract the type of people that they need to attract. 
right? And, and that they need to work with. And the people that can't deal with your personality, if you, you know, maybe do come off as a little abrasive or maybe like John said, a little, good, a little overconfident or something like that, you're, you're only going to attract the people that, that can deal with that and value that. So that's good because those are the people you need to work with anyway. Right. I mean, you only have a limited amount of time in the day. Yeah. And uh, for us people that, that network is part of our business, it, that it is, you know, something that we love and it's the, the way we, you know, we want to interact with other people and we want to conduct our business, but it is our business. You know, every person that we meet is potentially uh, food on the table. So we do take it seriously uh, how we, how we interact uh, with, with one another a hundred percent. And so we have a little bit, we, we were supposed to have someone coming on, uh, Andrea Proctor from Ohio. I don't know. They were having some server issues. I don't know whether she's going to come on or not, but I'll just talk a little bit about our relationship with Ohio. Ohio uh, is a, a networking platform. Uh, they pivoted during, uh, you know, during COVID to, from live events to networking, just like us, but in the networking perspective. And our hope is within the next month, we are going to be able to host really exciting uh, virtual events uh, with speed networking, uh, with a stage from where people can speak and then jump into you know, lounges and uh, be able to set up own breakout rooms for sponsors or people that are discussing specific topics and uh, that we are going to be able to you know, host events just like we did before but virtually and also beyond that, do summits and conventions and conferences. So we're really excited about that. You know, hopefully Andrea will jump in. If not, we'll have her on next week, but they did have uh, a technical issue. Yes, Clint. Um, so Dominic and I were talking about this earlier today. Um, is there any word on a date for the next live? either here or uh, no, I mean, we'll announce it when we have it. There's, okay. there's a lot of logistics because we're not just doing events here locally. We're now opening up, you know, to our 150 hosts around the country okay. and uh, we have to go to those events, but we will have a, a, you know, a three martini live, as I said earlier in the conversation mm -hmm. in Charlotte, it's in the plans and we're working for a new venue here uh, in the Raleigh area. Uh, just to you know, stir things up a bit so we don't you know, get bored going to the same place. We don't get that many opportunities to go out nowadays. We almost have to make every opportunity something exciting and an actual event. But as far as uh, virtual, what we're, we're hoping to do is to give people, since we've been doing a lot more national networking, we want to give people the opportunity to thrust themselves out uh, into that environment, especially our panelists on this program who have shown themselves to be leaders during COVID. I mean, it's a, a huge, I mean, some people ha have been on ev almost every single three martini panel uh, since the beginning. That's an enormous commitment of time. Uh, that's, I mean, we're talking about 80 hours of, uh, of uh, time that they've dedicated to continue networking at a time when networking is challenging. So I applaud you for that. But you know, really, that's given up two weeks of uh, full-time ability to make income, to help other people and, and being completely unselfish. So I want to throw out this other question, and this is just sort of a quickie. It's a fun one. You've answered this one before, so you probably have an answer. You can make it short. You can make it a little longer. It's up to you. Uh, but why don't we start with you, Clint, since we have you right there. Do you live to work or work to live? Um, work to live, I guess. I mean, I'd hate to look at it either way, I guess. But I, uh, you know, I have fun doing what I do because I work with you people. And so, you know, I, I don't even consider, you know, I mean, obviously I have a place of employment, but, you know, my real, my real work happens with you guys. And so that's, you know, I, I enjoy putting in time. I enjoy sitting on these panels. I've enjoyed every hour of sitting on these panels because it is beneficial um, to me and, you know, in turn to the people that I know um, because they get the benefits of me knowing you guys as well. So, you know, I, I, would, I would say, man, I just have fun, so. Well, you do a great, you do a great job at it. Uh, 
the two live events, Dominic, uh, I, I have had contact. It looks like Dominic's going to be having his next live event uh, November 12th at uh, the, the Mar Marriott near the airport. It'll be our first event with Marriott. Probably be doing events with Marriott all over the country if it works out. We want to get 40 people to that event. Uh, 40 is how we can do it. You know, we, we can do it safely and with distancing and have a great time with one another and uh, still have the feeling of having a lot of people. You know, so safety and also giving you guys uh, the opportunity to network. Dominic, do you live to work or work to live? Work to live. Like why? I mean, <laughs> I, I used to live to work when I was a chef. That's all I had time to do. So we couldn't answer any other way. But, you know, we, we, we do what we do so we can live the life we want to live. And it's as simple as that. And if the life that we want to live is being, you know, throwing ourselves into our work, then it's still the same thing. You're still living the life you want to live. So, you know, the career you're in now, you know, when you're a chef, you can have some networking. It's possible if you can squeeze an extra hour out of the day. Yeah, but as a financial advisor, you have the opportunity to network all the time, which is something you really enjoy. Yes. Okay. So to a, to an extent, certain extent, has part of your work become living? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I wouldn't, if I was a chef, I wouldn't, part of my job wouldn't be to go out with Clint on a Monday morning and play golf, right? But now that's part of my job. So I get to have fun while I work. I mean, not that cooking isn't fun, but you know, the, the, the difference between cooking for friends and family and cooking for a thousand is that you have to do it versus you want to do it. And with, with the type of work that I do, I can engage in any type of activity and, and meet clients. So I do the things that I want to do, like this event, like other Rockstar Connect events, like, you know, go on Jenny's podcast and talk shit with her. And <laughs> it's, it's fun. So do what I, do what I want. Excellent. Uh, John, do you live to work or work to live? Uh, I transitioned. Um, I'm in the middle. Uh, I have not gotten to the point where I am working to, so I can have tons of free time, but in coaching and mentoring and helping other people grow, that's not really work to me. Um, your wife is so, happy to have you out of the house, right? She's not ready for yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I just, I have, I have fun at whatever I do. So, um, I, I do not work. I do not live to work anymore. I, I only do those, those things in life that truly bring me joy. Um, so I'd have to say, um, you know, I work to live and the type of work I do lets me live a better quality of life. Excellent. Uh, Gene, do you, do you live to work or do you work to live? I think I'm in the middle too, but I probably lean more towards uh, live to work. I think I'm a little bit of a nut when it comes to that stuff. I, I find the busier I am, the more productive and the happier I am. So if I'm, I, I just enjoy it. I really do. I like waking up. I like helping people. I like, I don't like talking on the phone, but I like communicating with folks and not being able to talk on the, not liking talking on the phone hurts my business. But um, now I just enjoy it. I, I'm the, I'm the kind of guy that I, I like the new challenges every day and, I don't mind client interaction and I don't mind the fires and I, I just enjoy that. So I think I'm in, I'm in the middle, but, but closer probably leaning to, to that side. You know, it's interesting. So when, when I have a lot of work, sometimes I'm like, I wish I didn't have so much work. I could just, you know, turn off, turn the switch and turn it to, to fun time. But then when I'm not working, I'm like, gosh, boy, I really enjoy working. Yeah. So it, it's a, it's a comp, it's a simple question, but it's a complicated question. You know, so Sean, he does obviously something that he likes. Do you live to work or do you work to live? There we go. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah. So probably work. Probably, probably uh, live to work. Yeah, because because I do what I like. My work is my play, and my play is my work. So. Yeah, I'm I'm basically working all the time on some I'd love to ask, you know, that question from you 10 years from now. 
Yeah. And see what, see what the answer is. So you have a show coming up this Friday that people can uh, watch? Uh, is it this Friday? It's the, no, it's not this Friday. Oh, yeah, well, I will be on TV this Friday. Uh, I have a live show next Thursday. So this, this Friday, I'll be on Masters of Illusion on the CW Network, uh, 8 p.m. to 8.30 is the episode. Definitely check it out. If you're in North Carolina, it's channel 22. If you're in another state watching, just uh, Google whatever your local CW channel is, and you can see me on the show. And it'll be pretty, pretty amazing, pretty fun. It was a, a wonderful experience. I learned a lot, and I'm very grateful to be a part of the show for the second season in a row. And uh, yeah, the next Thursday on the 22nd, October 22nd, I'm doing a show in a virtual theater, actually. And I will share the link with you and Sarah, so you could share that with your members. And if it's something that you'd like, definitely check it out. It'll be my full evening show. Excellent. Um, and we'll shoot an email out for you. Jenny, do you live to work or work to live? So when you put it out there, I turned to my husband and I was like, so here's the question. <laughs> what would you say? And he just looked at me and I was like, yeah, I know I live to work. Um, That's what I would say. I would think you live to work. <laughs> I love what I do. I absolutely love what I do. Um, and so it never, well, no, I take that back. I'm not going to say never. But oftentimes it does not feel like work. It's a lot of fun. Um, I get to um, have really cool, like I get to meet really cool people and have cool conversations and like problem solve and, you know, just get creative. And it really, like it's my jam so i love it um but you know and i figured out how to work my schedule so that i time block and and my time management's improved so i don't feel like i'm getting like super drained you know and doing all the other stuff that i have to do um that goes along with running a business so you know i do need more hours in the day though there's no well, you know enough. it's funny so like when i was doing social work like you when I was a social worker, my biggest problem with social work was there was never a, like a closing moment. No. The only time like my job was done was when the person passed away. Right. Basically. And uh, when I got into sales and marketing and real estate, there was some, there was some end, you know, you set up an expectation, you fulfill it, you have a settlement or, or whatever it may be. But if you're really good at it, that relationship never ends either. Just like mm -hmm. you said. So when you're passionate about something and you do something really well, it's like an ongoing relationship. You work with the same people over and over again. Yeah. I think that it doesn't really change. I think if you live to work, work to live, uh, you, you may verbally say it's different, but probably if you dig, dug deep down, your relationship to work will remain the same. Well, I'm going to disagree only that when I was in the hospital, I literally like I would shut unless I was on call everything shut off when I walked out the door like I had to compartmentalize because the environment was such that um you know I would get caught like there were times that I would get calls when I would get um when I would get home I found my personal cell phone number in one of the call books one day and I was like y'all I need boundaries right because social work is one of those professions where you have to work really really hard to maintain boundaries because people are are so vulnerable and so helpless and so needy that you could just be like there's there's no it's a never ending list of things that you could do for them um especially you know the patients that i had that didn't have insurance and were you know had just had a stroke and they were the primary breadwinner and it was everything was a hot mess so i had to learn it took a while um but i definitely had to learn how to compartmentalize that because you could it could just be all consuming and that's not that's not that's different than to to me it feels different than living to work right like i can compartmental i mean i it, it's just it's a different um uh not having that boundary and not and and creating an environment where all you're experiencing is passion fatigue and burnout is very different than to me working to live and living to work Excellent. Uh, Arlene, what's your take on it? Do you live to work or work to live? It sounds like you're doing something now that you just really enjoy completely. And Yeah, I've got to say I live to work because 
I've tried to retire and I just can't. Um, and so what I do now is like a creative outlet for me. I've, I've learned from the bottom and worked, you know, every step of the way, worked through it to where there were a lot of downfalls and successes and, and, you know, over the, over time, I finally got to a point where it just kept getting better and better and I could help more and more people and be really excited about it. It's a lot of fun and exciting. It, it is though a love hate thing. Because there are times where I'm like, oh my gosh, why am I doing this? But I can't help myself. <laughs> That's like you might need a mentee because you have a specialized knowledge that you need to teach to someone else. Pardon you, me? Shut down, you need a mentee, some, oh, yeah. some someone yeah. to teach it to. Yes. You shut down shop, you know, you have some pretty specialized knowledge that other people are gonna want to know. Um, Jackie Wittenberg. I know the answer to this. Do you work, do you live to work or work to live? Now, Stephen, <laughs> I definitely work to live. Can you expound on that a little bit more? Um, let me back that up. I said that really backwards. I live to work. Look, I'm that bad student. I was doing something else when the teacher asked a question, and that's why um, I gave you a false answer. <laughs> but I definitely um, live to work. Um, I know that for a fact, uh, since there's no income that comes from my work. But it is a passion of mine to impact the lives of as many people in the most positive way that I can. And it's just a passion and um, it brings me great joy um, when I hear from those very people that I set out to serve in the work that I do. So I definitely, definitely live to work. Excellent. Well, thank you all today for asking those wonderful questions. We're very lucky to have uh, Sean uh, on today, and I believe he has an illusion that he'd like to share with us before we leave the show today. This may not come as a surprise to many of you, but for those of you who are new to this, I've been uh, joining the Three Martini Lunch, and I have, uh, I'm a magician, a professional magician, and I've been doing this for 17 years. And one of the most important things that we need to keep in mind during this, this time that we're spending at home more often than not is connection, staying connected with people that we love, people that we, we get along with and collaboration like we're doing right here. And so I'm actually going to make a connection with somebody here. Let's try uh, Jenny. Would you unmute yourself, please? Sure. Okay. I don't think you've ever been directly involved in any of the stuff that I do. So uh, I'd like to try this with you, Jenny. So in a moment, I'm going to spread through these cards here and you're just going to say stop anywhere that, that you'd like okay as i go through you just say stop stop right mm -hmm. there okay now you can have this card here you could have this one here the one behind it which one would you like the one in the middle or the, this one or you the first one the first one meaning this one that one yes correct one here correct correct okay just to show you, if you would have gone one more, you would have gotten the Eight of Clubs, but uh, you wanted this one right here, which is the, let's take a peek. Here it is. Okay. Uh, you remember that card? Everybody remember? Y'all are going to need to help me. <laughs> okay. Okay. Do you remember the number at least? Yes. <laughs> okay. I should write it down. <laughs> so here's how we're going to make a connection, Jenny. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use this dry erase marker. Now, you know, a uh, like if I were to use a Sharpie marker and I were to uh, just write on there, mm -hmm. it would stay forever and ever. But this is a dry erase, so I could just take my finger and wipe it off. You see that? Okay. So now I'm going to try to draw a little abstract dot here, and we're going to make a connection. There we go. Now, Jenny, I'd like you to hold up your right hand. Okay, and I would like you to watch the dot on the box. Can you see the dot on the box? Uh-huh. Okay, now I'd like you to touch the screen on the count of three, and you're going to transmit whatever that card is to me. 
Okay. Okay. Yeah. I make a connection through the screen. It's going to go through my body, up my arm, down my other arm, into the box. Ready? All right. Getting set. Go. Okay. Watch. Keep your finger there and watch the ink spot on the box. Watch the ink spot on the box as it actually starts. Oh like this little dance. Stop it! To where it goes. All the way and forms itself into a seven and a diamond. Does that look like a seven of diamonds right there? It does. Was your card the seven of diamonds? It was. That's. We just made a connection. How okay. did that happen? <laughs> That's how you make connections long distance with the magic of technology. That's that was amazing. awesome. That was awesome. Thank you. If he so told much. you how he did it, he would have to kill you. John. I know, right? That's amazing. Oh, it's not <laughs> awesome. Magic guys, relax. Uh, I uh, want to thank. Oops, I don't know what that was. I want to thank everyone uh, for joining us on the Three Martini Lunch. Uh, we will be announcing the next Three Martini Live. For those of you around the country who want to start attending live events, you can go to rockstarconnect.com. Uh, we do have a few coming up this week, a few here in North Carolina and uh, also around the country. Dominic, if you could tell people about uh, Thursday's event, the North Carolina Mixer. Yeah, so uh, Thursday evening at 7 o'clock on Zoom, we'll be having the giant North Carolina virtual mixer. We'll be having all sorts of our hosts, several of our panelists today, and uh, everybody will be able to participate. So we'll all be on the screen at the same time. We'll be utilizing the successes contagious format. Uh, and you'll get a chance to chat and, uh, you know, share some of your own personal uh, beliefs and opinions vis-a-vis -vis the question of the week. Uh, last week we had a little bit of fun with it as opposed to doing one question to everybody. I had 20 questions on a sheet of paper and a 20 sided die and whatever number came up, that's the question you got. So it was a little bit of fun. Plus we actually do oh, have martinis that. on that call. Wow. That yeah. sounds like a lot of fun. That uh, was a blast. Fun. John, you definitely want to participate that, you know, since you're out here in North Carolina, we'll let you know when we're doing that uh, Charlotte event. We should be announcing that in the next few days. I want to thank uh, everyone for attending. Uh, I really appreciate you all. And uh, I think we're learning more and more about one another. Uh, thank you, uh, you know, Jean, uh, for being on the show for the first time and Arlene. Arlene, I definitely want to have a deeper conversation uh, with you about what we do, because I think we could use your services. Uh, everyone just raise your hands, say goodbye, see you next week on Tuesday, 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern Time for the Three Martini Lunch Live. Hey, y'all. Have a good one. Thank you. Nice meeting everyone. Yeah, it was great.